Okay, how's it going, everybody? So we're going to read part three of the agrarian question by Stalin. Let's see here. Um, we're going to read. So last time he, he explained these three different you know ideas for how the peasants should seize the land, whether it was, um, what was it, socialization of the land, municip municipalization of the land, or nationalization of the land. He said neither of these three will do. But let's see at what the alternative that Comrade Stalin uh, provides for us here on this third section. We have seen that neither socialization nor nationalization nor municipalization can properly meet the interests of the present revolution. How should the confiscated land be distributed? Into whose ownership should it be transferred? Clearly the land which the peasants confiscate should be transferred to the peasants to enable them to divide this land among themselves. This is how the question raised above should be settled. The division of the land will call forth the mobilization of property. The poor will sell their land and take the path of proletarianization. The wealthy will acquire additional land and proceed to improve their methods of cultivation. The rural population will split up into classes. An acute class struggle will flare up and in this way, the foundation for the further development of capitalism will be laid. As you see, the division of the land follows logically from present-day economic development. On the other hand, the slogan, the land to the peasants, only to the peasants, and to nobody else, will encourage the peasantry and fuse new strength into them and help the incipient revolutionary movement in the countryside to achieve its aim. As you see, the course of the present revolution also points to the necessity of dividing the land. Our opponents say to us accusingly that in that way we shall regenerate the petty bourgeoisie and that is radically contradicts and that is that this radically contradicts the doctrines of Marx. This is what Revolution Revolucionaria Rossia writes. Quote, By helping the peasantry to expropriate the landlords, you are unconsciously helping to install petty bourgeois farming on the ruins of the already more or less developed forms of capitalist farming. Is this not a, quote, step backwards from the point of view of orthodox Marxism? I must say, I was back to Stalin, I must say that Mezios, the critics, have mixed up the facts. They have forgotten that landlord farming is not capitalist farming and that it is a survival of feudal farming. And consequently, the expropriation of the landlords will destroy the remnants of feudal farming and not capitalist farming. They have also forgotten that from the point of view of Marxism, capitalist farming has never followed directly after feudal farming, nor can it do so. Between them stands petty bourgeois farming, which supersedes feudal farming and subsequently develops in the capitalist farming. Karl Marx said in Volume 3 of Capital that historically, feudal farming was followed by petty bourgeois farming, and that large-scale capitalist farming developed only after that. There was no direct leap from one to the other, nor could there be. And yet these strange, quote, critics tell us <clears throat> to take away the landlord's land and to divide them up means retrogression from the point of view of Marxism. Soon they will say to us accusingly that the abolition of serfdom was also retrogression from the point of view of Marxism, because at that time, too, some of the land was, quote, taken away from the landlords and transferred to small owners, the peasants. What funny people they are. They do not understand that Marxism looks at everything from the historical point of view. That from the point of view of Marxism, petty bourgeois farming is progressive compared with feudal farming. That the destruction of feudal farming and the introduction of petty bourgeois farming are essential conditions for the development of capitalism which will subsequently eliminate petty, petty bourgeois farming. But let us leave these, quote, critics in peace. The point is that the transfer of the land to the peasants and the division of these lands will sap the foundations of the survivals of serfdom. Prepare the ground for the development of capitalist farming, give a great impetus to the revolutionary upsurge, and precisely for these reasons, that those measures are acceptable to the Social Democratic Party. Thus, to abolish the remnants of serfdom, it is necessary to confiscate all the land of the landlords, and then the peasants <clears throat> must take this land as their property and divide it up among themselves in conformity with their interests. That is the basis on which the party's agrarian program must be built. We shall be told, all this applies to the peasants. What do you intend to do with the rural proletarians? 
To this, we reply that for the peasants, we need a democratic agrarian program. But for the rural and urban, urban proletarians, we have a socialist program which expresses their class interests. Their current interests are provided for in the 16 points of our minimum program dealing with the improvement of conditions of labor. See the party's program that was adopted at the Second Congress. Meanwhile, the party's direct socialist activities consist in conducting socialist propaganda among the rural proletarians and uniting them in their own socialist organizations and merging them with the urban proletarians in a separate political party. The party is in constant touch with this section of the peasantry and says to them, and so far as you are bringing about a democratic revolution, you must maintain contact <clears throat> with the militant peasants and fight the landlords. But in so far as you are marching towards socialism, to resolutely unite with the urban proletarians and fight relentlessly against every bourgeois, be he peasant or landlord, together with the peasants for a democratic republic, together with the workers for socialism. That is what the party says to the rural proletarians. The proletarian movement and its socialist program fanned the flames of the class struggle in order to abolish the whole class system forever. For their part, the peasant movement and its democratic agrarian program fanned the flames of the struggle between the social estates and the countryside in order to eradicate the whole social estate system. Okay. Let's go ahead and read this PS that he's got here. <clears throat> so that's what, you know, that's some very, that, this third chapter is a very revealing one, you know. Um, it's important to understand about, you know, uh, the country, you know. You, you know, this is Marxist side, so we're going to know about the country out here, you know. <clears throat> it's important to learn what Comrade Stalin tells us, you know, what we can learn from Russia and Georgia and, you know, the uh, proletariat struggle all throughout you know, proletariat struggle and the um, uniting between the proletariat and the peasants, gathering all the workers together. Let's go ahead and read this PS. <clears throat> In concluding, this article, we cannot refrain from commenting on a letter we have received from a reader who writes us the following, quote, After all, your first article failed to satisfy me. Was not the party opposed to the confiscation of all the land? If it was, why did it not say so? End quote. No, dear reader, this is back to Stalin. No, dear reader, the party was never opposed to such confiscation. Already at the Second Congress, at the very Congress which adopted the point on the Otrecki, at that Congress in 1903, the party, through the mouth of Plekhanov and Lenin, said that we would back the peasants if they demanded the confiscation of all the land. Two years later, 1905, the two groups in the party, the Bolsheviks, at the Third Congress, and the Mensheviks at the First Congress, anonymously stated that they would wholeheartedly back the peasants on the question of confiscating all the land. Then the newspapers of both party trends, Iskra and Proletary, as well as Novaya Sizin and Nachalo, repeatedly called upon the peasantry to confiscate all the land. As you see, from the very outset of the party, as stood for the confiscation of all the land, and consequently, you have no grounds for thinking that the party has dragged at the tail of the peasant movement. The peasant movement had demanding even the Otreski, but already at its second congress, the party was speaking about confiscating all the land. If nevertheless you ask us why we did not, in 1903, introduce the demand for the confiscation of all the land in our program, we shall answer by putting another question. Why did not the socialist revolutionaries in 1900 introduce in their program the demand for a democratic republic? Were they opposed to this demand? Why did they at that time talk only about nationalization, and why are they now denning socialization into our ears? Today we say nothing in our minimum program, about a seven-hour day, but does that mean we are opposed to this? What is the point then? Only that in 1903, when the movement had not taken, yet taken root, the demand for the confiscation of all the land would merely have remained on paper, and the still feeble movement would not have been able to cope with this demand. And that is why the demand for the Otreski was more suitable for that period. But subsequently, when the movement grew and put forward practical questions, the party had to show that the movement could not and must not stop at the Otreski, that the confiscation of all the land was necessary. Such are the facts. And finally, a few words about the about Nobis Pertzeli. See number 3033. This newspaper printed a lot of nonsense about, quote, fashions and, quote, principles, 
and <clears throat> asserted that at one time the party elevated Otretsky to a principal. From what has been said above, the reader can see that this is a lie, that the party publicly recognized the confiscation of all the land in principal from the very outset. The fact that Snobis Pertzeli cannot distinguish between principles and practical questions need not worry us. It will grow up and learn to distinguish between them. <clears throat> okay. All right, yeah. So that is, uh, <sighs> that is the agrarian question by Stalin. That was the last bit of it here, the third part, and the P.S. on the end. <clears throat> yeah, this was written in 1906, you know. Well, thank y'all for tuning in. You know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, Tumblr, Medium, all of these are Marxist. You can follow me there. Y'all have a great day. Bye-bye.